I have a very distinct fascination with meta narratives and allegories. It was probably a gradual process because I was never really into literature until maybe my mid teens. And that's stretching it. <laughs> I was pretty much illiterate in both languages I spoke until I was seven. And I honestly never appreciated a good story until after I understood how reading worked. So <laughs> my odd fascination feels a little like it came out of left field. I'm, I'm, it's just a little, still just a little baby thing. It's very recent, very fresh, very organic. <laughs> but I can't really deny the thread that runs through all the things I find myself vaguely obsessed with. So let's talk about that. For context, a meta narrative is kind of a paradoxical idea, a story that comments on the structure of a story in order to tell its own. Not like a novel about a novel, necessarily, or even a novel about an author. I think we need a few examples. Fear Street is categorically a meta narrative. A horror movie made entirely of references from other horror movies as red herrings and using tropes from over decades of horror film staples to effectively divert the expectations of the audience in building on its surrounding mystery in order to make grand statements about biases and other prejudices. This reliance on outside knowledge has its downsides considering not everyone is a horror enthusiast, but the storytelling makes up for it by leading viewers in through simple context clues. Another great example would be Hades Town, composed of two very popular Greek myths, Eurydice and Orpheus's myth, and just as it had in the original, and they chide you understanding that you would think that the tale would end differently somehow. And though that in itself doesn't comment on the structure of storytelling, the fact that the musical is a loop of every time it is repeated from start to finish is part of its story. That no matter what happens, no matter what you know will happen, you will still hold on to hope in the face of tragedy. The acknowledgement of and inclusion of the audience, the fourth wall, into how the story is told and performed is just Allegories are like mini meta narratives, at least in my head. They basically do the same thing, pulling from outward knowledge to guide the audience to a certain conclusion. I know from teaching school that would be called schema, <laughs> but if I used if I used buzz terms in a fucking essay on YouTube, even I myself will start calling myself pretentious, okay? Let me have it. The major difference being that allegories are largely subjective and don't necessarily have to do something as ambitious as comment on its storytelling format or the standard format of its genre. All they have to do is make a symbolic whole, a bunch of small symbols standing to make the whole that despite the actual story could be read in a wholly different angle by every single one of its audience members. It's very, very concerning. It's all very poetic. A series of plot points that are outlining a theme or topic that, you know, they never address explicitly. Allegories are rarely intentional and only come up after you fully understand the entire story and sometimes they're not even 100% canonical. Mike Flanagan's Hill House is one of the best examples I can think of at the top of my head. All of it, the ghosts, the hauntings, the house that killed both mother and sister, the funeral, it all tolls around the very answer to the question that is, what actually haunts? Is it people, memories, places, regrets, guilt? Arguably, the novel by Shirley Jackson is actually also kind of an allegory, but of what is like your choice, at least? It's just so very vague. <laughs> a lot of people say it's like, you know, it's proto-feminist text in that it's about female rage in an era where um, female expressing female rage is very taboo, question mark? <laughs> I don't know. I actually think it's more about, I don't know, Nelly's trauma and how it manifests. It's, it's something that I don't see a lot of people like point out. I guess it's because it's a horror thing, you know? trauma and horror is like cane in hand or whatever but like I, I like to think a lot of it is because it's a character study whatever 
Of course, there's other ways to do this than through 10 hours of dialogue and brief but visual cuts to relevant plot items, but Aina Siesus also does this masterfully, especially considering the wide berth they give the grieving widow's own sentiments about her estranged husband's death. This is something I think I've only seen in Asian movies, really, but I feel like I'll spot it in other media soon when I get the time. <laughs> I just happen to know a lot of Filipino movies with struggling middle-aged women who don't address a lot of things. Almost like it's expected. It's a genera generational thing. I think I've seen a lot of like, um, like including who fell in love with him first. What's it called again? Dear X? Yeah. Including Dear X, that's also like a thing of like women who experience a lot of things and like who don't address a lot of what they think they should be addressing. I guess it's a... Uh, I haven't gone to therapy yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I've I think I saw it in Everything Everywhere All at Once too with Michelle Yeoh, except she actually does address it at some point. Well, kind of again not explicitly, where she's just like, yeah, I'm I'm kind of a bitch ish, but she doesn't address why that is specifically until like the climax maybe, because she has daddy issues, whatever. So now that we're all on the same page. Why the hell am I so fucking obsessed with these? If you've known me for long enough, I think the answer is a little obvious, to me at least, but I digress. You didn't watch this video just so I can give you a lead up without any payoff. This of course is just an excuse for me to talk about things I've recently got myself obsessed with, so bear that in mind. Grain of salt and whatnot. Mob Psycho 100. A comic series written and illustrated by one, the same person behind One Punch Man, is a story about a boy who just wants to excel in something to impress the girl he likes. He has OP powers that he rarely ever uses because of some deep-seated trauma, and he's essentially convinced that being psychic is just a part of who he is and not an ability he could hone like muscles or skill. For all intents and purposes, Mob, that's what I'm calling the series, not the kid, isn't subtle about using powers as a stand-in for something. Emotions, intentions, motivations, etc. Though it varies per character, the story primarily uses extrasensory perception or <laughs> as a lens to show Yushigeo and other espers lack of general social understanding because of their differing cognitive skills. They even show you. There are visual tells to how close Shigeo is to a meltdown, depending on the situation. And though the audience finds it massively entertaining when Shigeo does, hell, even the other espers are anticipating an explosion most of the time, Shigeo himself never views it as something good, barring a few moments throughout the series, which are few and far between. <laughs> Happiness in this story and in life is a lot easier to suppress the negative emotions. So when he breaks down, more often than not, it's because of a negative emotion, destructive and self-serving. His meltdowns, to him, are regressive and counterintuitive to his goals of blending in and getting along with others, of being, well, just a mob, an NPC, a background character. His ESB and repression essentially turn themselves into his own antagonists, because it makes him stand out against the grain in the way that he doesn't think helps him at all. And it, you know, hurts people, breaks things. Character studies this in death are rare in the genre they put Mob in. Shonen has a lot of common tropes, power crawls, absent parents or guardians, traumatized children too young to be saving the world, being given these responsibilities, power fantasies, but Mob sidesteps those and mocks them even <laughs> how dare anyone think that a child taking the burden of a responsibility is a good thing how dare anyone accept that some people are just more special than others how dare anyone think of force as a good avenue for development categorizing mob as an allegory is a personal thing it's hard not to read neurodivergence diagnosed or otherwise between the lines and emotions Mob is a good example of one of those allegories that aren't canonical. And though I would love if we could just collectively claim it as canonical once and for all to finally have that good representation, I'm inclined to not give the creator 
credit for something he might not even intend on. Though you can read Mob as an allegory for neurodivergence, it's still very much a story about adolescence, about the tightrope between societal ideas of masculinity and vulnerability, physical and emotional strength, and the fuzzy boundaries between the heart and the mind. I will save you the rest of my incessant rambling about Shigeo for another video or another Secret Treehouse episode. <laughs> if you know me from fandom, you're probably distinctly aware how much I can actually talk about him if given the time to sit down in front of an empty document. <laughs> Allegories are interesting to me for a myriad of reasons, but one of the few I'm willing to admit to in public is how easy they are to understand given you understand what they're alluding to or taking from. Keeping on symbols for one measly scene can lead to the feeling one may have of watching an, an art house film they don't understand. It's alienating and pretentious. What could have been a simple yet impactful scene just flops because it's too oversaturated. I know the creator's vision shouldn't compromise for an audience, but there are times where you have to strike the perfect balance because, well, even if you are making this for yourself, you should still be aware that other people are perceiving it. <laughs> anyway, allegories are a bit of fictional paraphrasing. Like comparing Redacted to Shrek 2. They're meant to both simplify and give the audience a better angle at what you're trying to show them. And of all the allegories out there, regardless of the fact I recently got myself obsessed with it again, Mob is a good example of that, that piqued my interest specifically for being something I could relate to. But I'll get to that. We still have to get through my second current obsession, and I apologize to any aunties in the stands, I am very much aware of the criticism towards it, and that's why you don't see me sharing fan content for it. Genshin Impact! I've been made aware that no one actually knows what goes on in this game apart from the gambling addiction and the very, very telling colorist tendencies of its visuals. For those who want to know, keep listening. For those who just want to skip to me gushing about lore, click to the timestamp. I, I got you, besties. I won't let you sit through too much of this even if I talk very fast. Alright, so Genshin Impact, a game by Hoyoverse. The company responsible for games like Honkai Impact 3rd and Tears of Themis is an open world RPG where you get to play the role of a traveler. The traveler, in fact. Regardless of which twin you choose, the story remains the same. The traveler and their twin aren't from this world, stumbled upon it while it was under a world-shaking conflict. As they were about to leave, they were barred from exit by someone calling themselves the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles, separating the twins, taking the Traveler's powers, and sending the Traveler into a deep sleep. The Traveler then wakes up 500 years later, <laughs> and after finding a travel buddy, they set off to find counsel with the gods of the realm, asking people one by one if they so happen to have seen their twin. And that's the basic premise. The reason I bring up Genshin isn't just because I'm currently obsessed with it at the moment, but because there's mountains and mountains of allusions to real life mythology in there. And yes, I used to be a Percy Jackson teen. No, you're not allowed to judge for that. <laughs> Video games alluding to myths and fictional works in real life isn't necessarily a new thing. In my very, very short experience with video games in general, as I do not have a console of any kind, apart maybe from my phone and whatever games are available on Mac. <laughs> no games are available on Mac, don't be ridiculous. A lot of indie developers like to put in little Easter eggs here and there. Some of them even become barely shadowed for shadowing, if you know where to look. One of the games I know have done this before is Life is Strange, where they drop in Easter eggs to nearly everything from books to TV shows and movies and the most innocuous things like license plates or even just notes on boards you pass by in the game. The references range from frankly harmless to the plot to this confirms everything. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Back to my point. It's not rare for works of fiction to pull inspiration from mythology or other works of fiction. It's a good basis. It's great. It's it's a little nerdy. <laughs> and what makes me think Genshin does it well is the fact that later on in the game, you start to realize that these illusions, abundant as they are, are there for a reason. 
it's not just there for aesthetic purposes, surprisingly. And I am actually surprised because I have gotten so used to mythology and culture just being used as set dressing instead of the respectful potential narrative devices they could be. And the reason for these illusions in game end up becoming very explicit once you play through, I think, second half of the first Archon quest. The short version of it is that Zhongli calls the Traveler a witness. He acknowledges in some sense that they are an outsider to the goings-on in this world. It's not really an open secret that the twins are aliens. Read literally, Zhongli might just mean that. Aliens who have witnessed the true histories that cannot be altered by time or Celestia. But since this is my example for meta-narratives, you can also read it as if the Seven acknowledged that the twins are, if not the fourth wall, then some kind of external force that can rewrite the natural progression of the plot. Suddenly, Venti making it so the Traveler is center stage in the confrontation with the Balan makes as much sense literally as it does metaphorically. Same goes for Zhongli letting some random person get involved in his retirement plan, and for A to be so hell-bent on the idea that if the Traveler gets even more entrenched in her nation's affairs, her idea of stagnant eternity is at stake. The Traveler becomes a catalyst for change, the deus ex machina in every hopeless situation that would have been resolved without their help one way or another. Because of their involvement though, the story becomes just a little bit more ideal, more hopeful. And that's such an interesting form of meta-narrative introduced fairly early into the game, if we're judging it with the understanding that Genshin will last for six main chapters, seven if we do get Kanria. For reference, we're currently about to start on the fourth chapter, if we're counting Mond as the first instead of the prologue. As it stands, it's not even a stretch to read it that way either. In one of the Archon quests, it's revealed that one of the main driving antagonists of the game, the Abyss Order, is undertaking an operation called the Loom of Faith. And later on, in another Archon quest, the Traveler's Twin, who just so happens to be leading the order, <laughs> is revealed to be preoccupied with staying in this world until they win their, quote, fight against destiny, end quote. <laughs> Understood literally, the order is pretty much just trying to get their revenge on with Celestia for wiping out an entire civilization while using their enforcers to commit mass genocide and millennia sweeping historical revisionism for the sake of the status quo. And with a sympathetic leader in the Traveler's Twin, they're willing to do whatever it takes. You know, war has casualties, etc. etc. As a meta-narrative, the idea of fate can be fairly equated to the overall plot. Time and control over time is against the heavenly principles, as is shown in a second story quest, because if someone can alter something that's already happened, then the whole plot gets thrown into the dumpster fire. <laughs> if you have someone like the Traveler, hell do someone's if we're counting their twin, you won't need to control time to tip the scales heavily in the favor of the previously, or in some cases inevitably, losing side. A witness. The Miraculous and divine intervention from beyond this world. The loom reweaving the threads of fate. The threads of all fate will be yours to reweave. In a way, it reminds me a bit of Pathologic's ideas of the game itself being a play. One you, as an actor, need to immerse yourself in in order to understand. Sans the tedious mechanics and dialogue-reliant lore doing the heavy lifting. And just when you think that that's the idea Genshin is trying to pull that they're reminding you that you're an outsider looking in, that you're one of the main reasons for the change these nations see, they twist even that on its head. The more you progress in the story, the more the traveler's responses to characters become just lines of dialogue instead of choices the player can make. There are even moments you're forced to play just as the traveler. You get locked into these scenes with no way out. The moment you reach halfway through the second Archon quest, the less choices you yet to actually make. The longer you have to play this role, the less it seems that the Traveler isn't just another character in the story. And it also plays into so many of the aspects they introduce, about how time corrodes all, even the truth, and hell, even your own memory. That one way or another, because the Traveler has been forced to experience their journey into Vought more intimately, by the end, there's a high chance they'll remain chained by the heavenly principles, the plot, until they remember that they're not from here. That they could be so much more. Or they could pull another, the Traveler's been an unreliable narrator and has 
been hiding everything from you all this time. Worked either way. <laughs> and um, that reminds me too of Sing Shong's Omniscient Reader's Viewpoint, a Korean web novel about the only reader of a very long story being forced into the world of said story after it ended. Three ways to survive in a ruined world, or three ways to survive the apocalypse, depending on the translator. I just call it Tuza. Kim Dokja, even if he's become a big part of this fantasy turned real life thing, is reminded time and time again that though he's made bonds and relationships with these people, these characters, he's still very much just a reader. He's there to witness, to reminisce scenes, and though his goal is to make it so the story turns out much more favorable, he's forced to remember that he's not the one writing these characters' stories. And despite that, he also needs to deal with the fact that he's being perceived by other audiences as well, by way of the Starstream. It's a very wonderful web novel. I haven't finished it, uh, but I highly recommend it. Yes, this is me cutting myself short because I don't need another obsession right now. I already rambled on too much for this one. So we've discussed Genshin and Mob to an extent. I refuse to say I've been extensive because I I barely scratched the surface on either of those. I, I meant it. <laughs> I meant it when I said there could be another video or a fucking Secret Treehouse episode for this. And now... I've explained to you what makes these things so compelling and interesting to me. And I don't know if I've made it obvious, but I'm fairly obsessed with lenses and perspectives and the way that twists the narrative and consequently our understanding of it. I love unreliable narrators. I think all narrators should be unreliable to an extent. Stories like these lead audiences to conclusions that aren't unexpected. But the way the audience is led to it is such a revelation. <laughs> like, finally getting the last clue that leads you down the path to the answer to a mystery. It all makes sense in the end. But damn if it wasn't a wild ride. <laughs> Above all, of everything I love in a good illusion or meta narrative, I value how much a character is being showcased. Whether it be as the narrative character themselves or just as the center of the story. Shigeo is rarely the narrator of his own story, but he's always been the center of it. The traveler ends up witnessing every single story in the game, but only later on do they end up showing parts of themselves that the player never knew about. <laughs> Even though if you dig deep enough, look through files and stories in their profile, it's been right there the whole time. <laughs> So, is it really their fault? Mm, kind of. Kind of. I think it's Hoyoverse's fault for not doing that right. Whatever. In all of this, I do want to address one of the most apparent things to me as I went down this rabbit hole of analysis. I'm more of a prose writer, but I do tend to dabble into poetry sometimes among all of the fluff from earlier both meta narratives and allegories to tap into the ideas i'm familiar with in poetry of skirting around or diverting readers perceptions of my intention and the sentiment i actually want to get to this actually ends up in my prose as well sometimes so i'm very fascinated in what other people do get, get a feel for their intentions they're trying to put forward to parallel in a story that they're trying to tell. Beyond that, as you've noticed in this essay as well, I also tend to compare and contrast stories I've experienced in order to fully comprehend said intentions. It enriches the narratives and my experience of it. It's also just really fun. <laughs> That's flavor, okay? <laughs> I think what's really apparent in my choices is the thread of foolhardy hope in all their characters. The incessant optimism that it has to turn out great one way or another. If it doesn't, then what else would there be? What else is left? Go through my list of videos I've done, and it's just honestly a little embarrassing how obvious it is. <laughs> well, of the ones where I'm not criticizing something, that is. Anyway, this was a lot more different than usual. I honestly contemplated whether or not I'd expose myself of being a Genshin fan, but honestly, at this point, I cannot bring myself to care anymore. I like what I like, you know? The internet is a political arena, Twitter is its WWE ring or whatever, I don't fucking care. With Mob's latest season coming out this October, I thought it'd be fun to gush about that too. I've always been more of a closet anime fan after middle school, but something about one's works kind of just brought it out of me again. So it was fun to talk about something I've dedicated around 140,000 words to. <laughs> I might consider writing fanfiction for it again, who knows. I already wrote like 7k after I wrote this script, it's kind of embarrassing. Okay, I don't know if I'll release it. 
thanks for listening to me ramble on and all that. Um, special thanks to my supporters as always. If you'd like to support me, my Kofi is open. Supporters will get early access to videos, extra files, and links to references I may or may not recommend for a video, bloopers if I have any at the time, and more in Discord server. And after all that, stay safe. Ingat tayo lahat. Bye!